589 verses 1 through 3, speak, O Lord, and serve with blessings.
fullness of your grace, that we may be called to repentance and made partakers of your heavenly treasures. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first reading, which will serve the basis of our sermon this day, is Acts chapter 7 and 8. Now when they heard these things, they were enraged, and they ground their teeth at him. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven, and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And Stephen said, Behold, I see the heavens opened, and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice, and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. And Saul approved of his execution. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church, and entering house after house, he dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our epistle lesson for this day is from 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Paul writes, I must go on boasting, though there is nothing to be gained by it. I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who, 14 years ago, was caught up to the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. On behalf of this man, I will boast. But on my own behalf, I will not boast, except of my weaknesses. Though if I should wish to boast, I would not be a fool, or I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain from it, so that no one may think more of me than he sees in me or hears from me. So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. In anticipation of the Holy Gospel, please stand as we speak to Alleluia first. Alleluia, they cast out many demons, and anointed with oil many who were saved, and healed them. Alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the sixth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus went away from there and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, and Joses, and Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor, except in his hometown, and among his relatives, and in his own household. And he could do no mighty work there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went about among the villages teaching. And he called the twelve, and began to send them out two by two, gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He charged them to take nothing for their journey except the staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. And he said to them, 
Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. And if any place will not receive you, and they will not listen to you when you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that people should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. And this is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. This time you may be seated as we continue with our children's message. Guys, I have something to show you from just the other day. Uh, we were doing some uh, gardening outside, me and Isaiah. We were pulling some weeds. And you know what I got in my finger here? I got a little splinter. A little splinter. And in particular, it was from a rose bush. I was pulling up the grass by this rose bush. And I, got, I was being careful enough. I should have been wearing gardening gloves. And I got this little splinter. Do you think that that hurt? Yeah. And Andrew, what happened the other day when you were in the swimming pool, when you reached your hand over the edge, what happened? Yeah, did you get stung by a wasp because we didn't see that there was a wasp nest there? Yeah, so sometimes, sometimes we can have these things called thorns in the flesh. And this is literally a thorn in the flesh. It's not very big, but sometimes we can have problems in our lives, right, guys? We can have problems where maybe our bodies hurt. Uh, or maybe we're just not feeling very well. Sometimes it just isn't going very well for us. But you know what Jesus says? He says, my grace is sufficient for you, and my power is made perfect in weakness. That's what he said to Paul. Even though Paul said a couple times, he's like, God, please take this away. But God didn't take it away because he knew that he could be there with Paul. Isn't that great to know that even when we have hard times or when we get stung by a wasp or Dad gets a splinter in his finger to know that Jesus is still with us. It's good to know that, right? And so we get to rejoice knowing that whatever hardships we go through, which there's a lot more hardships that people go through than just a little splinter in a finger or a wasp nest, uh, but, or a wasp, wasp sting. Uh, but we know that Jesus is with us every step of the way. So that's our message for today. At this time, we sing our sermon hymn number 839, O Christ our true and only light.
first lesson from the book of Acts, Acts chapter 7. Dear friends in Christ, throughout the church year, we have all of these different uh, liturgical seasons. Uh, recently, we finished uh, the season of Easter uh, and began uh, the season of Pentecost, the season where the color, of course, has now ch changed uh, to green, and it's green forever, uh, as my aunt uh, likes to say. Uh, eventually, uh, we'll celebrate uh, Reformation and the, the end of the church year with Christ the King Sunday. We'll journey again through Advent and Christmas, then get into Epiphany and Lent until we come full circle to Easter uh, and Pentecost once more. Now, we have this calendar uh, really to, to remind us of, of who our God is uh, and what He's done for us in His Son and how He continues to be at work in us, in His church, by the power of the Holy Spirit. But occasionally, uh, we have these days in the church uh, which are known as feast days, uh, days in which the regular color is actually set aside, uh, and it's usually changed uh, to red. Uh, one such day is the Feast of Stephen, uh, December 26th. The old song goes, Good King Wenceslas looked out on the Feast of Stephen. Now we're a long way uh, from Christmas, a long way from the technical day of the Feast of Stephen, um, but Stephen uh, is who we're hearing about today. And if you know anything about Stephen, uh, he is known as the first martyr uh, of the church. And when you and I hear the word martyr, uh, we usually think uh, about those who have died, uh, and in particular, those who were put to death because of their faith in Jesus. Um, you might have heard of a magazine before called The, the Voice of the Martyrs. Uh, and again, that's a, that's a Christian magazine that focuses on Christians in areas of the world where persecution uh, is especially high, uh, where people often die for their faith in Jesus. And so yes, uh, being a martyr uh, certainly means that one could uh, die uh, for their faith. But friends, when we go back to the New Testament uh, and we, we look at this word martyr used in the Greek, there's actually kind of a broader use of the term. When Jesus is speaking to the disciples in Acts 1, uh, that they will be you know, going around with the gospel message, going around with the good news that he brings uh, when the Holy Spirit comes upon them, he says that they will be his martyrs, his martyrs. It would be his, as we translate in English, his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost part of the earth. And so to be a martyr means to be a witness. Uh, and Stephen, the first martyr, the first one killed for his faith in Christ, becomes a martyr in that sense because he first was a martyr. He was a witness. Lord Jesus is. And as we look at our text uh, for today, a friend of mine shared that we see Stephen uh, being a martyr in three distinct ways. He is Stephen the preacher, he is Stephen the visionary, and he is Stephen the intercessor. So let's start with Stephen the preacher. Friends, if you have someone uh, in your life who is able to just call a spade a spade, who is able to tell you like it is, you know, instead of sugarcoating everything. Having these people in our lives certainly is valuable because these people are our friends uh, and their input is what we need to hear of. And that's what Stephen is here. He's one who's calling a spade a spade. He's calling a thing like it is. He's shooting it straight with the people. And you'll notice uh, that our reading starts this way. Now when they heard these things, they were enraged and they ground their teeth at him. Uh, and it makes us wonder, well, you know, who's the they? Well, the they in this text is the religious leaders. You see, after Stephen was chosen uh, as one of those seven deacons uh, who was helping to assist in the care ministry of the church, um, Acts 6 later tells us that he was filled uh, with the Spirit and he was full of grace uh, and power and wisdom, and he is doing many signs and wonders, and he's pointing people uh, to Jesus and against how the religious leaders uh, have been doing things. 
parents. Our reading doesn't share uh, what Stephen says, but at the beginning of chapter 7, if we were to look back at that, we would see this incredibly long sermon in which he goes about detailing pretty much the whole entire story of the people of Israel, going all the way back to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, uh, to Joseph and to Moses. And the thing that Stephen points out uh, is that even though Israel was chosen by God, they so often disobeyed him went after other gods. Even though God sent prophets to his people, trying to get them to turn and to come back to him, the people of Israel often rejected them too. And so it is on this day that in Stephen's speaking, he says to the religious leaders, you stiff-necked people. You always are uncircumcised in heart and ears. You always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you have now betrayed and murdered. You who received the laws delivered by angels and did not keep it. Stephen the preacher tells it like it is. And the religious leaders don't want to hear any of it. But friends, as we uh, think about our lives, God does the same for us today, too. We're not the religious leaders, but just like that, just like anybody, we need to hear God's word of correction, too. And God loves us enough that he sometimes is going to, he is going to give us that word that we need to hear, not always that word that we want to hear. Whenever we hear a word of law that confronts a particular sin in our lives or exhorts us to love people who we would rather not spend time loving or to demonstrate a fruit of the Spirit that maybe is a little bit underripe in our lives, that word of correction is meant to lead to repentance. It's meant to lead to trusting in Christ and then going with that good news of Jesus once more. And so just as God sent prophets to his people of old, so he still sends preachers today. Preachers that you need to hear and preachers that I need to hear, too. So next is Stephen, uh, the visionary. Again, we heard uh, the religious leaders, they are enraged. They're one moment away from putting him to death, which may make us wonder in this moment, why is this happening? Why is this happening? What is God up to here with his servant Stephen? After all, he had been caring for the church. He had been doing signs and wonders, pointing people to Jesus. Why isn't this another Pentecost moment where many thousands of people are coming to believe in Jesus? Yes, it's not that, but rather what Stephen is experiencing is an angry crowd ready to execute him. Where is God in all of this? As you think about hard times uh, in your life or the lives of those close to you, what image do you have? What image do you picture? Just hang on to that for a moment and, and turn your attention with me back to the text. What image does Stephen see as he's going through this hard time? But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold! I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. In this hard time, in this difficult moment, Stephen sees Jesus. And what's interesting, actually, here is the posture uh, that Jesus has as Stephen sees him. You see, we usually talk about Jesus sitting at the right hand of the Father, right? This is actually the only place in the entire uh, scripture where Jesus is described to be standing uh, at the right hand of the Father. And why is that? I mean, you and I uh, are familiar with moments where we go from, from sitting uh, to standing, moments where we uh, get out of our seats. Uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, my parents took the boys and I uh, to a Milwaukee Brewers game um, and, and there was, uh, in the middle of that game, in one inning, there was a grand slam, and in the next
match uh, inning. There was an inside the park home run by the Brewers, by the way. Uh, both get out of your seat kind of moments. Earlier in the game, before any of it started, uh, we had the national anthem, and there was a salute to the, the servicemen and women of our country. Another get out of your seat moment uh, as we paid our respects to our country, uh, to those who protect the freedoms uh, that we have. Um, we do this not only in our lives, but we do it in church too. Uh, we go from sitting to standing. The invocation as we get ready uh, to hear that God's name is announced and His presence uh, is among us. We stand in reverence for the gospel as we stand as the offering is brought forward, praying that God would use that to be a blessing to our ministry here and in this community. Uh, we stand uh, whenever we have those hymns with the little with the little triangle. Uh, referencing uh, that we're singing a special hymn of praise uh, to the Trinity. Uh, as we come forward for communion, we stand. After communion, we stand. Uh, there are these moments in our life and in our worship in which we get out of our seats. So what is making Jesus stand here? I think Jesus is standing to be a martyr for Stephen, to be a witness for Stephen. Interceding for Stephen, even as he nears the end of his life. Jesus is seeing what's going on, and he's saying to his father, this one belongs to me. He stands for Stephen, and friends, he stands for you too. Jesus is a martyr, a witness to his father for you and me as well, saying, he's baptized in my name. She trusts in me. They, I, I died and I rose for them. Isn't that neat to think about? That now, even now Jesus is pleading our case. Even now Jesus is our martyr. Jesus is our witness. So that our vision in him, uh, or our vision is him, uh, even when we go through tough times. And finally, uh, we've got Stephen, the intercessor, after describing this vision of Jesus, the religious leaders cry out with a loud voice and says that they stop at their ears and they rush at him, and all of them begin to stone him. Yet with, with his dying breath, it's amazing how similar Stephen looks and sounds like Jesus. Just like Jesus, Stephen is accused falsely. Just like Jesus, Stephen is sentenced to death falsely. And did you hear what he said? He said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. That is very, very similar and very close to pretty much the exact words, two of the words that Jesus says on Good Friday. Right? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. This is what Stephen has realized by the gracious power of his God. Jesus Christ is capable of covering the worst of sins. His death on the cross paid for them all, every last one. So as Stephen falls asleep in his Lord, he reminds us not to fall asleep on God's forgiveness either. What it does in our lives and what it can do uh, in the lives of those around us. Because after all, did you notice uh, who was there present at the stoning of Stephen? Luke tells us this, and the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. Saul is the coat keeper, if you will. He's guarding them while the others carry out Stephen's stoning. But Saul is the one who becomes Paul. Stephen intercedes for one who gives approval to his death. And this one becomes one of the greatest stories of forgiveness of all time. Because he goes from persecuting the church of God to being one who is a great proclaimer of the gospel. Uh, after he hears and sees his own encounter with the Lord Jesus, and on the road to Damascus, and then also his vision with the Lord, as we're told this day, where, he, where, the, where Jesus said to him, My grace is sufficient for you, and my power is made perfect in weakness. Yes, Paul goes from being one who can't.
can't stand the preaching of Stephen and the other apostles to one who preaches the gospel message far and wide with boldness and confidence. As a result of the persecution against Stephen and the other Christians, the, the church is scattered about to many different areas, which leads to more proclamation, which leads to more growth. So that ultimately, over the course of time and space, that message could come down through history and be here in St. Genevieve for you and for me to hear and rejoice in this day. All that comes as the Lord hears Stephen's intercession. His prayer of forgiveness for those who were against him. And so we intercede this day too. As Jesus said, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Who is one today in your life who maybe is especially difficult to love? Who is one in your life that you can pray for? You never know how God will answer that prayer and bless it. Now friends, there is, in case you're counting, 171 days until Christmas. 172 days until the Feast of Stephen. But as we continue this journey through Acts, let's rejoice. Now let's rejoice in the preaching of God's law and gospel. Let's rejoice as we see Jesus standing on our behalf, bearing witness to his Father that we belong to him. And let's rejoice at the intercession of, of, of others that has led to this preaching and vision being shared with us too. And so that we are given the opportunity to intercede for others in Jesus' name, pointing them to him too. In Jesus' name, amen. Now may the peace of God which passes all understanding guard to keep your hearts and lives in this Christ Jesus to life eternal. Amen. At this time, please stand as we confess our faith this day with the Catechism, the third article of explanation from Luther's small catechism. We speak together. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. What does this mean? I believe that I cannot, by my own reason or strength, believe in Jesus Christ, my Lord, or come to Him. But the Holy Spirit has called me by the Gospel, enlightened me with His gifts, sanctified and kept me in the true faith. In the same way, he calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the whole Christian church on earth, and keeps it with Jesus Christ in the one true faith. In this Christian church, he daily and richly forgives all my sins and the sins of all believers. On the last day, he will raise me and all the dead and give eternal life to me and all believers in Christ. This is most certainly true. What are the identifying characteristics of the church? The identifying marks that guarantee the presence of the church are the clear proclamation of the gospel and the right administration of the sacraments. These are the Spirit creates faith. God's word or promise is sure and does what it says. What are some other outward indications that the church is present?
through his death and resurrection. Raise up pastors, missionaries, teachers, and others in a churchly vocation to be sent by you to proclaim your message of law and gospel. Strengthen laity to live as your church each day among our neighbors, pointing to your light and your love. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Compassionate Father, we face daily the trials of this world, the devil, and our own sinful flesh. Often a thorn in the flesh is a barrier to our faith and trust in you. Remind us your grace. Grace is sufficient, and your power is made perfect in weakness. For those who are weak in body, mind, and spirit, grant your continued presence. Heal according to your will, and use as your church to encourage use us as your church to encourage, support, and reflect your grace to all who are in need. Especially this day, Lord, to lift up those who are homebound for Val, for Barb, for Sharon and Wanda, for Doug, Doris, Nick, Carol, and Pansy. And for those healing and in need of recovery, for CJ, for Nevea, for Kelly, for Megan, for Bill and Dustin, for Pastor Jim, for Mike, Sue, and for Race and Clarissa. Lord, we ask that you would continue to be with these your servants and give them healing according to your will. Lord, in your mercy. Sustaining Father, you gather us together as your people to hear your word and to receive your means of grace. As your church, strengthen our fellowship as we receive the true body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Fed, nourished, and strengthened in faith, enable us to faithfully uphold your calling to us as we are sent by you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Lord Jesus, we rejoice with those who rejoice this day, especially celebrating birthdays this week for Vicki, for Jeff, and for Jim, as well as for those celebrating anniversaries for Dean and for Lisa. Lord, we ask that you continue to uh, equip uh, these, your servants, continue to bless them with many more happy and healthy years of life uh, as they find their joy and their peace in you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And into your hands we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. 
this do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. As often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Come, oh, Lord Jesus. O oh, Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, in giving us your body and blood to eat and to drink, you lead us to remember and confess your holy cross and passion, your blessed death, your rest in the tomb, your resurrection from the dead, your ascension into heaven, and your coming for the final judgment. So remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, Lord in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And the peace of the Lord be with you always.
rebuke and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And we go with the blessing of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. You may, may be seated for our closing hymn, number 644, The Church's One Foundation.
news letter yet, uh, please do so. Those are back in your mailboxes or back on the table. Uh, we've got the portals of prayer books for July through September that are available as well uh, out in the Nurtex. Uh We've got a couple of meetings coming up this next week. Church Council meets uh, on Saturday morning at 9. Uh, elders will meet on Sunday at 7.15. And the next, uh, next Sunday also is the quarterly uh, voters meeting. Uh, as a reminder, Jure de Fête is coming up here uh, just just about a month or so. So please uh, uh, look through your homes, find your knickknacks and items uh, to, to bring in for that. And I think that's all I have to, to share this day. Are there any other announcements? Oh, that's right. Thank you, Donna. I almost forgot. It's Vicky's birthday today. So we're going to sing to her. <laughs> Happy birthday.